The beach would be covered in semen. Yeah. (laughs) Not from a shipwreck. (laughs) Not from a shipwreck, no. (laughs) Hello and welcome to the UK Surf Show. I'm Pete. And I'm Leighton. On today's show, we're going to talk about progression in surfing from a beginner to an intermediate surfer. We'll go over the points of what it is to be a beginner uh, and help you out with some of the terminology and then what level you're at to intermediate and what that, what that consists of. And we will also have a few questions which I have put out and asked from some beginner surfers and some people who want to get into it. All right, let's, let's get into it. So uh, being a beginner surfer, uh, there's some terms and speak that if you're a beginner, you're not going to know or haven't heard of before, and you'll hear other surfers using them. So just to give you a bit of a heads up, we're, we're touch on them so you know what they are. Uh, what terms, Pete, would be useful, do you think, for a beginner? Uh, line up. Yeah. So line up is uh, out the back of the surf where all the kind of intermediate to advanced surfers sit to wait to catch an unbroken wave. Um that's basically what the lineup is. You'll see all the surfers sat out in the sea waiting for, for waves to come. Cool. And um, so those those waves are also called green waves, if you if you hear that. An unbroken wave is a green wave. That's cool. And what about something along the line of duck dive? Yeah, so duck diving is what you see surfers doing to get out to the lineup. So it's the way that they get through a broken wave they'll push their board underneath the unbroken wave and pop up behind it and and keep on paddling is that the only way to get through an unbroken wave uh no it's not so that's generally short borders do that on a long board which as a beginner you'll be surfing at a larger board uh it's difficult to push the thing under the water because it's uh very buoyant so you see some surfers even even better surfers, intermediate and uh, and advanced. On longboards, they'll do it's kind of like an Eskimo roll, uh, where they'll they'll flip over and the board will be on top of them, and the wave will just pass over them. So yeah, that one there is called a turtle roll, and the turtle roll is you as you flip over that you leave a gap between yourself and the board, slight gap as you pull it to your chest, and the water passes through. As the wave comes over you, you slightly turn the board and it will flip you out the back if you time it right. It is a manoeuvre that takes a lot of practice. Yeah, it's. Um, but if you get it right, when the wave goes over you, it kind of pulls you up the right way as well, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it catapults you out the back. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's definitely a useful, um, a useful manoeuvre to, to know. Uh, also, you might have seen the sign that surfers do. It's called the uh, the shaka sign. You want to explain that one, Pete? The shaka sign. That's the uh, originally it was the hang loose sign, the shaka sign, which is like the the thumb and the little finger um, loose hand hang loose. Originally, yeah. Look, so a lot of the a lot of the VW guys still use it, don't they, to wave to each other? So yeah. is it kind of like like VW have basically capitalized on surfing haven't they with the with the vans and stuff so if you're a vw owner you'll know what we're talking about when you wave to another vw owner with the shaka sign so it's like you would put a thumbs up but you also put your little finger out as well yeah. uh well, what about boards should we uh talk about boards yeah let's talk a bit about boards boards well, you could talk you could probably do four or five episodes on boards to be honest but we'll go just into beginner range and if you want to start us off uh, yeah, so we we look at the different types of boards. So the, the a beginner board that you will have at a lesson is going to be what they call a foamy, which is a foam-topped board. Uh, this basically doesn't need any waxing. Uh, they're very, very buoyant. They're quite heavy, uh, but very stable. Very fun. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, once you progress from that, after that, you're, you will move to a... A similar board, but it w- it won't be a foamy. It'll be um, like a preformed board which you wax up, 
and as as you progress you you basically get more expensive lighter boards and generally the the buoyancy goes down to help you maneuver and after that so we've so we've gone through the foamy board and now you're on to a long board or mini mile depending on your size weight yeah that's right so should we let's talk about the components of of the boards that there's just standard uh components for them so we will have shapers on the show at some point and we'll go into these in a lot more detail but if we just tell you what they are so as a beginner you're going to know what you actually stood on so the length of the board is obvious that goes from the nose to the tail and it is always in uh, feet and inches um so like i'm riding a nine foot two yeah, and I'm on a nine six at the moment. Yeah, so, so we're both long boards. Yeah, so we're riding long boards. Um, you might also hear some surfers or shapers talk about volume of board. This is how buoyant it is. It's measured in liters. I think as a beginner, for every kilo you weigh, should be one liter of volume. So I don't know what my board is. I don't think it's ninety two liters of volume, but. If you were a beginner, that's what you're the kind of thing you'd be looking for. Okay, cool, yeah. Also, if you flip a surfboard over and look down towards where the fins are, often there is some numbers on the bottom, and that will give you the size of the board in feet and inches and the volume of the boards down there normally as well. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And uh, if it's a shaped board, you will generally have the surfer, the shaper, sorry, signs it, doesn't he? Um, so another part of the board, so Pete's mentioned the fins. So you have a, a tri-fin, which is three fins, uh, or one single fin. The actual difference in those doesn't really matter in, until you get more into intermediate. But like I said, we'll go into that in future podcasts with shapers who know a lot more than what we do about that kind of thing. The, the very top of the board is called the nose, and the very bottom of the board is called the tail. They are shaped specifically for different waves and different abilities as well. But generally, as a beginner, you'll have a rounded nose and a flat square tail. Uh, This is meant to be the best setup for stability. And what about movement and turning of these boards? Are they... No, that's that's the compromise, isn't it? Uh, So when you... When you go for stability, you generally lose uh, your ability to to move the board through the through the sea. So you wouldn't know that looking at some of the really good long borders. You'd well, see, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you know if you're it's like anything, isn't it? If you're really good at um, at surfing, you're going to be able to surf any board, aren't you? Really, yeah, really yeah, well. Definitely make it do whatever you like. It's it's one of those things as a it, when you're beginning as well, it's a very um easy misconception to think the shorter the board someone's riding, the better they are. Yeah. And that isn't the case. It's although a lot of the short board riders are amazing, it you're judged more, mainly in surfing on your ability to control the board and to turn the board and what you can actually do with the board. I yeah, think. it's meant to be to to make it look as effortless as possible yeah so and that, that's got a lot to do with reading the wave as well um so another component of the board are the rails uh the rails are the shape of the edges of the board they um, they are shaped differently depending on what board uh we'll go into why they are shaped differently in another podcast like when we talk to a shaper but just for now just so you know the components of the board a really important one is obviously the leash which is fixed to the tail of the board and that goes around your foot and it's whatever foot is towards the back of the board. You see some people wearing them just underneath their knee, don't know, the top of their yeah, shin. Yeah, there's different different types. So uh, when he says foot, it's actually around your ankle, just above your foot, the leash. Don't try and wear the leash around your foot. You'll look uh, a bit strange. Yeah, around your ankles, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Or, or around your wrist. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, I've seen people do that as well. Come down with a surfboard tied to their wrist. Yeah, yeah. thinking their body board is... Yeah, that's a uh, different kettle of fish. We, we, there, there is a couple more. There's a couple more components. So we have the the stringer, which is the centre of the board. Generally, you'll see it as a line down the board. Um, this actually, uh, th- this gives the board its shape and strength, but it, it also is a good marker for you to know where the centre is. It's going to help you when you come to pop up on the board to know where the very centre is. This is also 
the thickest part of the board. And it, that also, the shape that it gives the board is called the rocker, which if you looked at the board side profile, it is the the height of the nose and the tail off of the bottom, if you like. It gives you that banana shape look. And that's called the rocker, and that is made that shape by the shape of the stringer. Okay, so that's that gives you a general understanding of what is involved in a board and what you're looking at. Um, as Leighton said, in further podcasts, we'll speak to a shaper and we'll speak to people who know in much more detail and can give you much more information about boards, why they're shaped the way they are and how different things affect the way you move through the water. Yeah, there's a, a whole science behind it. So I'm looking at making my own board at the moment. So I'm a, I'm a joiner by trade and with a love of surfing, the natural progression in that is is to want to make a wooden surfboard. But the science behind it is kind of immense. So I really want to us to chat to, to shapers to really help <laughs> yeah well i'm a painter by trade and i just painted my board not yeah, long that's, ago. <laughs> yeah you've got you've got to combine your skills haven't you yeah well what can you do um so that that roughly goes on to the basics of the board as we said the boards go up then in different sizes they you know you get smaller and smaller um but we'll go through that as we get to it Next next thing on the list then, what about where you stand on the board, where you lay on the board? Yeah, so on, on when you have a lesson, which is really important, they a lot Do of coaches stress that yeah, enough. it's really, really important. You will you will avoid the mistakes that we have made and you'll save a lot of time and you'll enjoy yourself a lot more and get to a level that you'll enjoy it by even more like without a coach. Um so what coaches just generally do now is they will find on the board the widest and thickest part of the board and they will draw a line on that point. So that's generally, if you're on a long board, just over, I think it's about two thirds of the way up or just over halfway, they'll draw a line there and a cross right below that. The cross is where you put your chest. It's really, everybody just concentrates on where you stand on the board and it's really important of where you lay on the board because it will help you paddle. And if you can save energy on your paddle, you'll have more speed because you're having more energy to catch waves. Yeah, that's definitely one of the worst things. There's nothing worse than using all your energy paddling out to get out to the back and then you're there and you go to catch a wave and you've got nothing left. You've you've got no energy at all. Shagged. Yeah. Um, so where, where you lay on the board, uh, your chest goes where the cross is and your your feet go obviously towards the back of the board. Try and not have your feet dragging in the water uh, and that's basically where you lay on it. Obviously you want to be on the centre and not off to one side. Uh, and then we move on to how to paddle. How to paddle. There's the, It's another one. There's a massive science behind this. There's the amount of youtube videos i've watched the amount of people i've spoken to about paddling it's there's masses of it i think everybody has their um their different kind of techniques but yeah. what what's worked for us what we find is that you is a lot like swimming you have that kind of cupped hand and you place your whole arm in the water and you push the water underneath you so your hand is kind of under the board a little bit, not out to each side, which you might think you'll you'll basically want to be as streamlined as possible. Uh, and it's 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 all to save energy. That's the that is your main goal is saving energy. Yeah, you'll hear surfers talk about paddle fitness. Um, paddle fitness is something that takes a very long time to build up. You you get to a paddle fitness and you think, oh, that's it. I find it really easy to get out to the back. I find it really easy to move around. And if you don't go surfing for few weeks even oh, a it's month gone, yeah. it's gone again yeah, it's, it's definitely that yeah. don't don't use it and you lose it yeah i found myself of um for paddling i've i found it very difficult i for a long time i found it very hard to get any distance on it and i started swimming on a regular basis two or three times a week and my paddle fitness improved massively by that so yeah. that's another thing you can try I think it all goes along with the with the lifestyle, doesn't it? Like that, if you're a surfer and or you want to be a surfer, it does 
kind of seep into every part of your life. So you, you all of a sudden, if you don't work out, you want to work out because you want to be fitter out in the sea to be able to get more waves because your paddle strength needs to go up. So that kind of as a beginner, that if you you know where to lay on the board, you know how you're going to paddle uh, to to catch the wave. So and move the out. next thing you want to do is pop is up. Pop up, yeah. So this is the part that everybody focuses on. It's just standing up, just standing up. That's all I want to do is stand up on the thing, which is obviously important. But the other stuff is equally as important to be able to do that. So there's lots of, you can search on YouTube. There's lots of different methods that people use. What the advanced surfers and high-end intermediate surfers are doing is they spring to their feet straight away and land perfectly on the board. And where they put their feet... Um, will be the same place where you put your feet. It's just how you get to that point. So where they put your feet is where you had your chest laying on the cross is where your front foot goes. And your back foot should just be in front of where the fins are under the board. So for years, I was putting my foot, my back foot right at the back of the board. And that's actually putting the brakes on. So your front foot is the speed and your back foot is the brake. So if you lean on your front foot, the board will go faster. And if you lean back on the fins, it will slow down. I had the complete opposite where I would stand up too far to the front, or too close to the front, I should say. And if it, it, it does the complete opposite, it doesn't slow you down. It pushes the nose into the water which you then end up just somersaulting through the Yeah, legs. yeah, and we've all done that. Yeah, when legs you, go over your head about four or five times. It's uh, quite disorientating. It's when you wipe out and your eyelids get pulled open. Like it, it's, <laughs> it's so, the sea is so oh. powerful that you can't even hold your eyes closed. And that is, that's so, yeah, I think I had, a, I had a day at Putzborough and um, I just made it out to the back and I went to get on a wet, no, I didn't, I think I got on a wave, wiped out, turned around to come back in, got hit by another wave, and my leash snapped, which then the board got fired back into shore. And uh, it's a long swim with a panic (laughs) of, one, oh my God, I'm so far out, I've got to swim back in. And two, there goes my brand new board. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I I could just see the board ending up on the shore and some kid picking my board up going, oh, I found a surfboard. I'm trying to swim back going, oi, oi. And it, it, there's that thing, isn't it, where you you come off the board and you lose stuff. Like we've both lost cameras. cameras yeah, yeah, cameras are gone. You know, there's watches are ripped off you. Yeah. Uh, so you, I think like, there's a lot of wetsuits have the key holder. I never used oh, the key holder. Me. I, yeah. My that's another thing. I actually, put where to put your keys. Um, I got a key cut for my van, so I can wear the key around my neck and wear it in the water. It's got no electrical stuff in it. Um, safest way I find it's underneath your wetsuit that's not coming off at all well I don't know I'm waiting for that day to happen wipe out in a big wave and you come up naked <laughs> <laughs> you're hoping <laughs> okay right so after the pop up you're you're popping up on oh no sorry we didn't go over the other methods of pop up did we so the advanced or high end intermediate surface are springing straight to their feet there are a, another, there are a few options after that. So a, a coach will tell you to slide to your knees and then put one foot up onto the cross that we spoke about and then press up with your ankle as you turn sideways with your back foot. Um, I do kind of, I, I, miss, I miss out the knee slide. So I'm quite tall, I'm 6'3". Like, I'm and it, I find it difficult just to be able to spring to my feet. So what I do is I, I manage to spring to like a lunge position, if you like, and I push up off my ankle from there. Yeah, so, I think I I don't know what I do anymore. I I did used to go to the knee, and I miss that now. So I'm I'm more into a pop up stage, but I couldn't actually tell you without rev- like off the top of my head. I just get up. <laughs> the the main the main thing is locking that front foot in. Yeah. Because if you it. don't lock the front foot in, you'll be doing something with the back foot and that means putting the brakes on and the speed yeah. is crucial. Because so the speed of the board and how fast you're popping up is really crucial at, at the start. That will if you can get those things down quickly, 
that the surfing experience just be so much nicer much better much better it all goes back to that beginning thing of have some lessons because this stuff it's all very well listening to this stuff and it might help you out a little bit if it can brilliant it is nothing compared to what a surfing coach can tell you teach you they can spot all the mistakes you're making and they can save you years and years of frustration and being a kook yeah that was which is another terminology yeah kook (laughs) So a kook is someone in the water who doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah, we were kooks. We were yeah. proper kooks. But we really were. Yeah, it's um, it's a learning curve. You know, you can't go straight in and know everything. And um, so after you've got the pop up, is there? Any, there's a, there's a couple other pop ups you can look on look on YouTube. At chicken foot things. was one, wasn't chicken it? Foot chicken as well. foot. So the, that's when you lock the back foot in place first by sticking your knee out to the side. So you kind of like doing a commando crawl on the board. It's a controversial one. Yeah, I'm uh, not too sure if it works, are we? Yeah, it's um, there's a lot of controversy around on that one. Um, uh, so after you've done the pop up. Um, then as a beginner surfer, you're probably going to be wanting to surf broken waves to start with. So you're further into shore, you're out of the way of everybody, you're learning to stir- surf, you're learning to stand up on the board, and the broken waves, so you're on the white water. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, it's, so th- this is ju- just the very beginning, and you just want to stand on the board, so you're not looking at moving across the face of the wave. You're using just the power of a broken wave. That energy is pushing you forward when you do that. So you probably don't actually need to paddle. When the wave grabs you, you know, it shoots you forward and you can just start your pop-up process. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Don't, there's a lot of bad habits I see people starting off standing next to the surfboard and then jumping onto the surfboard to get a move in. That does... Even though you'll get a wave like that or a broken wave like that, it, it won't help you in the long run. Make sure you're paddling and you'll get used to that paddling motion as yeah, well. It, yeah, if you can stand in water, uh, then, then make sure you, you're led on the board. Don't just stand there because yeah, you can. You want to yeah. be led on the board. You want to simulate what it's going to be like at, at the back. So that's that's everything of being a beginner surfer, really. like As soon as you're standing on the board on a broken wave, you can then start making the progression and transition to an intermediate surfer. So, the things we have on that, the very first thing I think is going to be finding the right conditions for you after that, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Finding the right conditions. So once you go from those surfing those broken waves as a beginner, don't look at it and go, oh, it's going to be massive that day. I'm going to go and try and surf. It's, it's no point. Go on a day when it says it's going to be two, three foot, maybe, something like yeah, that. Yeah, good, good, nice practice a, a waves. A nice little practice wave, small waves, where you can practice, you can, you'll, be, you'll find it easy to get out further, and you'll find without it easy... Drowning. Yeah, without drowning. And you'll find it easy just to paddle along onto a wave and to get there and to be able to stand up. Yeah, so the, the surf forecast is what you need to start to learn how to how to read... And again, we will go into this more in depth, but just to touch on it today, um, the main one that everybody seems to use is magicseaweed.com and you can put in the location of your local break and it will come up with a series of information. They are, we're we're touching them quickly. So it will have the breaking wave height, which is obviously you want to to see, but what's equally important are the stars and those stars are giving you a quality rating of that wave. Yeah, so you'll have dark blue stars or light blue stars or no stars. They're the stars. The There's no stars, obviously, not very good. Light blue are saying what it could be if, if the conditions if are the right. Conditions are yeah. right. And dark blue stars are saying what it should be there. Yeah, so it's rated at five. We've very rarely seen five blue stars. If we did, we'd not be sleeping and <laughs> we'd be down five there. Five blue stars. No. Four or five foot, five blue stars. Yeah, not, not working The beach would day. be covered in semen. Yeah. <laughs> not from a shipwreck. <laughs> not from a shipwreck, no. Um, anyway, just moving on. Yeah, so you, you, the wind direction is important. Knowing the local break is important. So by that I mean what the high tide is like. So for instance... We sometimes surf at Westwood Ho. You can't. Well, you can surf Westwood Ho on a high tide, but 
you're on the rocks and it's very difficult. Yeah, a bit bit more dangerous. Yeah. So, so uh, that that's what I mean by knowing your local beach. Yeah. So you need to know the breaking wave height. You want to see what stars it is. You want to see the direction of the wind. Now, magic seaweed, they're really helpful with colour coordinating that. So if the wind, wind is in a good direction, it will be green. Yep. Uh, and orange, if it's surfable still or kind yeah. of in the right it direction. It varies, doesn't it? And red is just normally not worth going. Yeah, that's going to be... That's going to be onshore wind, isn't it? Which yeah. means so the- you want you want ideal ideal waves. You want an offshore wind. It pushes the front of the wave up, and it's it's a better wave all round. Yeah, makes the the wave itself flatter. The way the wave face will be flatter. Um, if the wind is coming behind, generally it pushes the the waves down. Um, so. Once you've selected what day you're going on as an intermediate surfer, you know you can stand up on the board now. You've got your pop-up down. You, you're you comfortable with paddling. It's then getting to the lineup. So most of the breaks in the UK are beach breaks. There are a few point breaks. We'll go over the difference in those in future podcasts as well. Uh, but just for today, just for the progression, uh, because we feel like this is the biggest the biggest hurdle is getting to the intermediate part. So, so at so, a yeah. beach break, you want to try and find you want Yeah, rips. you do want to try and find a rip. Um, certain beach breaks have them in certain places. Uh, we're not going to tell you where they are. You can work them out with yourself because um, otherwise you can the see area, them. Okay. You, can, you can see them. Um, it's the area where the water runs back out. They're a good area to get into to get out to the back quicker. Yeah, so when when you turn up at your at your your local beach break or wherever you decide to go, as an intermediate surfer for the first time, you want to stand on the beach for five or ten minutes, just observe what the sea is doing, and you'll see where there is less white water. So as the water is coming in and the waves are breaking, that water needs to go back out, and it will find, obviously, the easiest path, and that is where you want to paddle out. It will be a little bit like a conveyor belt, and you will come across less white water to have to fight through and less waves to have to do your Eskimo roll under or your turtle roll. So as soon as you find that, jump in there, paddle out, using uh, using the, the, the paddle strength that you've gained and your, your technique laying on the board right, and you should get out the back. Like we went to Saunton a couple of weeks ago, and um, yeah. we we paddled out, and we were out the back in like ten paddles. I reckon it was just crazy. Yeah, it, was, it was it was it was, uh, it was very easy. Yeah. So so once you're out to the back, then next you've got you want to be surfing green waves. Then, which like we said before, green waves means unbroken waves, and. You want to find what they call the sweet spot on that. So the sweet spot will be the perfect point to stand up on the board when the wave is about to break. So you'll see surfers, when they're out at the lineup, they'll be looking at the horizon. The wave is coming in in sets. Uh, What that means is everything moves in cycles and the waves come in generally in about a set of four four or five. It is at Saunton, isn't it? Four or five. And then it will have... A kind of like a, a break behind that and then it will come in another set of four or five it doesn't mean there's no waves between it it means the waves in between are kind of rubbish or not big and yeah. there'll be like a bigger set coming in yeah definitely. and a a surfer will look at the horizon and see where those waves are kind of getting bigger and paddle their self to the right position to be able to get the sweet spot so also, when you when you're now out into these positions, when you're onto the green waves, a lot of things change here. So, whereas you were surfing white water before, and you could take your time to get up, you've no longer got that time to get up because as soon as you start paddling and the board starts moving, you've got to get to your feet as quick as possible because any amount of time you take longer than that, and you're wiping out every single time. Yeah, and that is going to be different for everyone as well. Like our, our um well, my pop-up process is not as quick because we've just become intermediate surfers. So it's not as quick as what I want it to be. So I know it takes me longer to get to my feet, which means I have to paddle harder 
to have enough speed to catch the green wave and start my pop-up process sooner. So as soon as my board starts to tilt, I start my pop-up process, but I need to be moving quite fast yeah. before that point. Yeah, I think my pop-up's a little bit quicker. Um, I don't know if that's from years of picking myself off the floor from skateboarding. Well, yeah, you're more, you're more in, from the skateboarding scene than what I was when I was with yeah so you know that's one of the things it's it's getting up as quick as possible as quick as you can get up and you'll you'll learn you'll work that out and you'll find out where that is um another thing i remember thinking at the time looking at people thinking how do you turn like going from the white water not being able to turn at all or anything like that just basically going in a straight line so how do you turn and as soon as you get onto a green wave everything changes just the slightest touch on your board and you can turn really easily. Yeah, the, the board will, depending on the shape of the rails, but if we're talking about longboarding, the rails will dig in to that wave, and because they are shaped in kind of like a like an oval shape, that's a lot of surface area for the for the wave to hold on to, and, that, and that, so it stays stable, um, and that that's how you turn, really. You just lean, and it, the board does what it's designed to do on an unbroken wave, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it glides. It's, it's uh, you know, it, well, when you get there, it's a hell of a feeling first it time is, that yeah, happens. Unbelievable. And that, that's why this is so addictive, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very addictive. Um, we touched on as well, going out, it, it, the easiest way to get out to the back is in a rip. Also, in a rip, you can also have the opposite effect where you turn around to try and get waves back in or you've been in the rip too long or you've drifted into a rip and not realized and all of a sudden you can't get back in properly because it's still doing the same thing it's pushing out um this is something we'll have to go into in detail at some point as well but the gist of it if you're stuck in a rip the easiest way to get out of the rip is to turn sideways and start paddling sideways and you'll get out of the rip which sounds kind of obvious doesn't it but i know we've both been stuck in it before like i was swimming in the sea and got stuck and i was paddling like was swimming like hell to try and get in and you're you because your natural reaction is get to the bloody beach yeah you Quick, panic you go into a panic i mean it not long ago i got stuck in a rip knowing what i know now and knowing how to get out of one i still got stuck in a rip and i was trying to come back in and wasn't moving tried to go left wasn't going anywhere tried to go right wasn't going anywhere and i was at the point where i was thinking i'm gonna to have to turn around and carry on sort of paddling out but at an angle so i come out of it diagonally and a guy came past in a um a canoe type thing he goes do you want a tow and just towed me out to the side slightly yeah. and I was out of it which uh, it can still happen now so you know it's one of those things well, although you can use the rip just be aware they are very dangerous as it, well it was a bit embarrassing in my mind so I, I, I wasn't very old I was like 13 or something like that and so I learned my lesson with the rips quite quite quickly I was 34. scared of them straight away and so I'm swimming in and I can't I can't get in and a little old lady in one of those like 1960s swim hats with all like the little kind of lumps on them swims past me in breaststroke and just said yeah you just need to swim sideways love and that was it which kind of saved my life without even knowing it like and so it's kind of embarrassing yeah um but going going back to the green waves and the sweet spot so when you are paddling for for the sweet spot which is where you need to stand up because you're going to be paddling towards that pot to towards that point you need to be out at the lineup further back, if you know what I mean. So you're going to paddle to that point. You're going to catch up with the wave at the point that it's going to break. So when you are stood on the beach at the start or when you're paddling out, you'll notice where those waves are breaking. And generally, they will break roughly in the same place every time. Like It does very slightly, but generally in the same place. So you need to note where that is, paddle past that point, and then you're sat up in the lineup waiting for your wave. And when you've selected your wave you can paddle to the sweet spot so is there there's there's rules to this as well by the way so you can't just paddle out there and then turn around and get the first wave and cut everyone off um you'll get shouted at you more than likely you get punched as well yeah it's it there is there is an etiquette to surfing there is a there is rules where you have to line up it's called a line up because you have to line up and traditionally you line up and you take it in turns the f- the first one goes and then the next one and the next one and, and so on and so on yeah i think um what we've been doing recently but i've noticed some locals out there and i've kind of been letting them 
letting them take it when it's been women has been busy. Uh, they obviously know what they're doing and they've sat for a long time. But at the same time, if you've paddled out and the wave has come in, you you'll see the surfers look up and down the line who's going to go for it. And a couple of people generally go for it, and which is fine. You know, you can have a, a couple of people as long as they're not too close together. Yeah, they but go if different somebody, directions or whatever. If somebody gets on the wave and you're paddling out and you think, that's a good wave, I'm going to go for it, that's a definite no-no. You yeah. can't get on that wave. There's Yeah, there's that. And the only thing worse than... If you're a beginner, you can... Sometimes they'll, they'll let you off and, you know, you, you get to learn, you know, intermediate, you get to learn. The only thing worse than that is a snake out there who is we've had it a couple of times when they'll you'll be there waiting in your position for the next wave you know people waiting beside you or behind you or whatever and they will paddle out past you and try and get the wave and cut yeah. you off again that's the, that's even worse that infuriates everybody on yeah the, and those like people that. aren't really part of like the surf scene that we we want to be part of and what I feel like we are becoming part of they, these people You like you, in every walks of life you get dickheads don't you yeah. and um some of them are out in the water and they yeah so it's called snaking they'll snake your wave basically you're you're sat there at the lineup waiting it and someone will pass pass you paddle out further and expect to have priority on the next wave um so yeah be aware of those people yeah cool and then i suppose that leads to paddle strength and fitness um Fitness is something I'll let Leighton talk to you about because he's much more into fitness than me. I my my fitness is about two sit ups a day, one out of bed in the morning and one back in at <laughs> night. Um, so I'll let him take the fitness side. Uh, so well, basically, fitness is going to help you in the water. It's going to increase the the amount of time you're in the water. It's going to increase the amount of waves you can catch, and it's going to increase the quality of your surf in in general. You'll be able to you'll be able to paddle out to the back and have more energy when you're there. You'll be paddling faster to catch a wave, which some people might not be able to get because they're not paddling fast enough. Uh, the the energy of the wave changes when it's a green wave. So when, on your on a broken wave, the energy is pushing you towards the beach and giving you speed. The speed is generated on a unbroken wave or green wave is from gravity. So it's like going down a, a like a skate ramp, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so to be able to get that wave, you need to be paddling quite fast. Uh, and they, they, they say five big strokes before you start your stand up process, your pop up process. That doesn't always work, but it's no. a good rule of thumb to yeah. follow. And, and so the good thing with the fitness side of it is you can do that at home. So in, in effect, you're, you're surfing every time you work out. Yeah, I think um, I think they don't. They've got no sponsorship on the show or anything. But I think North Core have got a paddle fitness system that um, you can use, which sort of is resistant bands, and it's supposed to help you increase your paddle fitness. There's different things like that that um, come around. But paddle fitness, as we said, is one of those things that is takes a long time to build up, and it goes very very quickly if you don't maintain it or keep using it. And you know you've said swimming is help for you. That's oh, going to yeah. swimming's like, massive help. Like your breathing massively. work is going to help with that, isn't it? You yeah. Know, like I'm I'm not a great swimmer. I can swim it. I think the furthest I've ever swam in one go with no breaks is like no breaks. Two hundred and fifty. <laughs> yeah, I got to take breaks. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you, thought you meant like brakes, like brakes on a car. No. <laughs> That's where you're going wrong, mate. <laughs> no, it's, it's about, uh, is it, it's like 2,000 metres or something like that. That's quite good. Yeah, no, it's not though. Because like, well, Rach, my partner, she she can do, I don't know how many kilometres she can do. Well, no, actually, I think it might be 1,500 is what I did. And and that nearly, nearly killed me. Um, But... The, the the one thing like with the fitness side that's helped me so last the end of last year I did my back in it really affected surfing remember when we went surfing I was like oh, I can't do it it's yeah. just like got he, he, he didn't say it like that he was fuming he was absolutely fuming he's done his back bit. in he can't surf it's bloody ridiculous he's never going to be able to do it again everything was the worst yeah. thing ever so ba- basically I had a, an an injury from from work. Uh, didn't get it sorted, went, thought everything was fine, carried on as normal, uh, actually went to the osteopath and had, it was like, I was mechanically out is what, what she told me. I got put back in place and then got recommended yoga and it just completely transformed it. So we went from 
the start of December, recovering from a bad back, to the start of January when we went, when we went surfing in Nuki, and the surf uh, experience for me was totally different. To after one month of yoga, yeah. well, I was doing it every day for a month, and it was just the. And when when we were in that surf trip, we were doing yoga in the morning, weren't we, before surfing? Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, so you know that's 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 things that are going to help you. Also, I think one of the biggest things for progression, as we said already, is going on a small day and getting those getting those small waves, and they'll just help you to build up your confidence, build up your pop, build up you knowing where you want to be, and it's just going to generally help you all round. Yeah, you, you don't have to be surfing monsters to be a surfer. Like we're we're living in the UK, surfs pretty shit. <laughs> yeah. so you yeah. take you take what you can get you'll see you, there'll, there'll be a day when it's two to three foot but if the stars are three or four dark stars it will be rammed yeah definitely there's uh there's uh there's a lot to there's a lot to look at in the uk surf forecasts and when when the you know the days are going to be good it's going to be rammed and you're going to have to fight for your place well hopefully we can get someone on who really knows the science behind it and they'll yeah. be able to tell us more so we so, got we got some questions out haven't we yeah from- yeah we got so that pretty much wraps up the beginner to intermediate you know progression what you're going to do what you're going to look for we'll go into some of these things in much more details as we go through with people that know more than yeah. we really yeah with people that know a lot more than us but We've also got a few questions that are just from uh, some people I know that I've just asked. They've asked me before. They want to get into surfing. What do they do? Um, so if you have any questions for us that you'd like to put to us, you can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Look for the UK Surf Show, or you can email us at the UK Surf Show at gmail.com. Um, questions got at the moment so the first question i have if you are not a strong swimmer can you still surf uh well you're a strong swimmer aren't you, you but yeah, i'm I, a strong swimmer and i find i find it helps a lot yeah um, i'm not a strong swimmer but i i think you have to be a competent swimmer you have to be you have to be able to swim yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah don't, you know, don't, don't, just, don't, don't try and try surfing don't grab yeah, your board and your your water wings as the americans call them yeah. <laughs> you go out with those on your arms yeah because um Gook. yeah um like i had i said i said earlier my my leash snapped all of a sudden you've got no board and if you can't swim there's only one way you go in and it's not yeah forwards it's not into the beach no. yeah so yes yes you can if you're not a strong swimmer you do have to have a, an ability of swimming yeah um but you don't have to be the strongest but as we we're saying with paddle fitness you know the stronger you are at swimming the better it's going to be okay that answers that one what do the flags mean on the beach your standard flags on the beach are going to be your red and yellow flag which is your swimming area no boards allowed in that. So yeah. the, these flags are set up by the, the lifeguards on the beach. Yeah, so this is mainly going to affect summertime surfing. They do um, they do go into winter on some beaches, but it just varies where you are in the country. Um, and then you've got the black and white flags, which are for surfers. And those are the areas they put out that are monitored. Yeah. You can go outside of those areas, Yeah, but they're not monitored and you're not be protected by a lifeguard or anything so if you're a beginner or an intermediate stay between those black and white flags also the other flag you might see is a red flag which can mean various things mostly meaning that strong rips yeah not advisable don't go out yeah all pretty simple stuff all the information will be it's the rlni now isn't it so they'll have all the information on their website if uh, if you need to look it yeah um does your height and weight make a difference to your board we've slightly covered this already uh yeah so we initially it does doesn't it we think it does yeah i think you need a when you're definitely when you're learning you need a board that is buoyant enough to take your weight when you're sat still on the board waiting on the board you know you're not yeah. sinking down too far you're you're moving you see some short boarders sat on the board and their boards right underneath the water it's not till they start moving that the board comes out of the water. That's a different level altogether. But when you're beginning intermediate long boards, you know, mid-range boards, you need a buoyant board. There's new boards out now. Um, I think they're honeycomb boards or something like that. Right, yeah. And they are supposed to be super buoyant. Apparently, I don't know how true this is, we'll look into it, that they're, 
I heard that you can get a hole in it and you can actually carry on surfing it. It's that yeah, buoyant. Amazing. Yes, so there's that one. And what is one piece of advice you would give yourself if you had to go back to the start? Lessons, lessons, lessons. So, so important. You're going to save so much time if you can just find a decent surf school with decent coaches. Uh, A lot of them are like kind of gap year kids uh, that that do the the lessons. If if you can kind of help families go out and learn how to stand on the board but if you can find a surf school that has some old pros in them because they, they are around yeah uh, definitely that, that is just totally valuable there's also a massive scene starting well it's, it's been going quite a while now but for um female surfers in the uk as well which i know there's clubs down in Saunton which uh cater specifically to girls and ladies to get out and surf as part of a club I mean, it it probably could be quite intimidating as a woman trying to get into a. Yeah, maybe because I think a lot of the surf, well, all all the surf coaches I've seen are, are all men. Yeah. So you know, it it might be nicer. Yeah, if uh, if they have some uh, some women teaching them. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that pretty much wraps up for what we've got to talk about today. Yeah, yeah, that seems like it. So our next episode is going to be an interview isn't it yes yes we're hoping we don't know who it's with yet because we've got a few lined up but um yeah we'll pick one at random and uh yeah. let you know next time so don't forget subscribe to this podcast let us know what you think find us on facebook find us on twitter find us on instagram search for the uk surf show and let us know anything you want to hear in the future and let us know if you think there's anyone that would be worth speaking to or worth interviewing yeah that'd be great and so we're gonna do our air shackers at you through the through the radio or the podcast you can do it or not no, i'm just gonna look at you <laughs> yeah cool, cool. cool. <laughs> all right all right guys well stay safe out there if you're going in the water and we'll see you next time goodbye, goodbye.